Our second speaker is Melanie Kirby. Uh, she's our New Mexico WAS Regional Director. She owns Zia Queen Beads. She's involved in a beekeeping collective or collaborative, and she's pursuing a graduate degree at Washington State University. She's a native New Mexican with a new perspective. She merges traditional values with modern tools, such as the radio frequency tags that she uses in her research. And uh, Julia mentioned RFID tags also. Um, so, and Melanie's a, a world traveler. She, she's been overseas for a while. So it's my pleasure to introduce our board director from New Mexico, Melanie Kirby. So Melanie, it's yours. All right. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, Julia, that was awesome. I really enjoyed um, your presentation and I loved the humor and the, the drawings. That was, that was distinctive and very creative. Um, yeah, so hi, I'm Melanie Kirby and I'm, I'm here in um, Santa Fe, New Mexico currently. Um, this presentation is called Navigating the Genetic Labyrinth in Her Majesty's Chambers and it's an initial queen breeding and rearing concept overview. Um, I'll also be talking briefly about my um, thesis research, which I'm finishing this spring semester at Washington State University, um, evaluating mating behavior of different subspecies of honeybees utilizing RFID or radio frequency identification. So the labyrinth, as I like to do a play on words, is a maze that amazes. It does require um, patience and skill, a curious mind and a steady hand when um, dealing with queens and queen rearing in particular. Um, but it is something that is approachable for any size beekeeper and all circumstances. So a little bit of review, the family unit, you've got biology and environment, behavior and the bees nest or management. Um, and uh, you've got queens, you've got workers, you've got drones in terms of the cast, there's queens and workers, they're both female, but um, demorphic and how they uh, physiologically come to be. And they are diploid, meaning that they have a set of X and Y chromosomes. They come from fertilized eggs. Then you have drones, which are haploid, meaning that they are a um, single set of chromosomes. And so as a metaphor, um, they are clones of their mothers. They only carry her genetic information. Um, they're not true clones, because obviously they're male, but as a metaphor, that's what it would be uh, similar to. Um, then you've got hive mechanics, which a lot of that has to uh, come about through their genetics um, and their environment, which is going to portray in a certain type of behavior and then how they're managed. So we as their beekeepers are also a big part of how they um, display. And fitness and longevity. Some of that is based on their genetics and also environmental conditions, including forage or lack thereof. So we have to ask ourselves, who are the bees? Where are they from? And who are we as their keepers? Um, some may think that all bees are the same, but they are not. There are actually some distinct, what we call ecotypes um, or subspecies or strains or races of bees, a few different words that that kind of relates to. Um, there are several different kinds that we have here in the States. And of course, a lot of them are um, crossed out. So very hard to find purer strains, but you know, as reflective in its peoples, um, which is we are a country of immigrants and so are our bees, they are immigrants to this country as well. The dates um, underneath each of these pictures reflects on when they were um, recorded as being brought to this country. So we have Apis mulifera, also known as the um, little black bee, which is from Europe, um, Apis mulifera lagustica, which is Italian bees, and Apis mulifera carnica, which um, comes from Eastern Europe. So a little bit of review to kind of go back in time here, a proverbial trip down memory lane as I like to describe it. We're gonna look at the distribution of the genus Apis. So there's several different kinds of Apis bees. Um, we've got Microapis, which are dwarf bees, Apis florea and Judiformis. Um, the Mega Apis or giant bees such as Dorsata and Indica. And then you've got um, the Apis cavity nesting bees, which there's Apis serrana. And then there's also uh, Apis mellifera, which is honeybees as we know them with a Western honeybee. And various letters, M, A, C, and O, correspond to um, where they are originating from. And here's a few different theories of those migrations. You've got uh, M equals Western Europe, C is Eastern Europe, O, Middle East, A, Africa. And people do tend to um, combine C and O to a certain degree, but 
This is from a paper by Han et al. in 2012, and the link for the full article, which is open source, is written there under figure B. But um, the yellow sort of starburst there is where they're uh, indicating where they believe bees originated from, and then as different topographical influences, whether it's mountain ranges or bodies of water, um, sort of directed bees navigated around these and, and spread out. And as generalist pollinators, they're really good at adapting, so they have been able to spread out. But as they settled in these different areas, they really became very nuanced um, to the particular climates and locations that, that they settled in and became ecotypes. So there's over 29. I heard of a recent one from South Africa, um, South Korea, sorry, um, that was shared at the Montreal um, Epimondia conference a couple of years ago. And these are endemic to the Eastern hemisphere. There's formal trinomial applies. So they're all Apis mellifera, which means honeybees. But then for instance, Lagustica, we also call those Italian bees. That refers to the subspecies or the ecotype or the race or strain. So you can see this map here, and this is uh, from Shepard and Mikeser in 20, 2003. So a known subset were brought over. Um, and so not all of these different kinds of bees were brought over, but a few of them were brought over as We've got our first settlers that came to this country. And then bees started to um, proliferate and spread out. You also, um, you know, it was a very long and arduous journey, so it wasn't easy for them to get here. And so once bees started really adapting and proliferating, then that kind of ceased. And then you had the, um, the invention of steamboats, which really kind of brought another influx of bees over that made it easier. But then in the 1920s, they shut the borders to, um, two importations of bees due to the Isle of Wight disease, which is um, also known as tracheolite. So here we have um, a chart showing when these were recorded as arriving um, and their origin. So there's a few different kinds. I did put Russian on the list here, um, although they are not a, a true subspecies or ecotype, they're actually a cross, but they were brought in um, in 1997 by the USDA ARS Baton Rouge Bee Lab. And then WSU, Washington State University, has a germplasm importation program as well, um, looking to bring some of what they call old world stocks in that are uh, more familiar with various pests and diseases, such as varroa mite, and bringing them to the states to um, help broaden genetic pools here and, and distribute resilient stock lines. In 2015, they actually brought over their last um, newer stock line to add to the germplasm bank, which is uh, Apismophora pominella um, from Kazakhstan, it's from up in the mountains. And so these bees are, are used to uh, the seasons and cycles of apples, apple production. So now flashback to the future um, and what do bees and beekeepers need now? And what do we have? and how are we managing them is a very interesting question because it really varies across the country. Um, and I'm gonna focus in, this is actually a little bit dated, it's from 1995 from Ship and Shepherd um, and modified by Dr. Deborah Delaney um, when she was doing her doctorate out at WSU. But these are showing, um, this is showing the major queen production areas of the United States at that time. And of course there's more producers now, but this is where the concentration still sort of remains even today. And so you've got California and then some of the Southern states. Um, the bottom two in California are uh, sort of reflective, at least one of them is reflective of um, some breeders, uh, the Glen Apiaries who are actually retired now. So they're, they're no longer there and they actually switched to instrumental insemination due to um, aggressive bee strains encroaching in their area. But when we see that concentration, um, it does make us wonder, you know, how are ecotypes in the United States established? And we don't necessarily have those. So I'm going to kind of juxtapose that to some research that came out of Europe not too long ago, um, talking about honeybee genotypes in the environment. And so I'm just showing here that within these diverse geographic and climatic landscapes, there exhibits substantial population genetic variation known as geographic races. This is just showing that there are um, specifics that, that develop over time, and that's what creates these subspecies within the broader honeybee species. Um, same with this paper, too, talking about the widespread adaptability is represented by subspecific variation and indicates that certain subspecies may be able to mate 
in certain weather conditions. So um, they are learning from their environment and then becoming attuned to those cycles and really then creating a um, what we call epigenetics. So it's their own genetics, but certain behaviors are turned on or off due to the environment and that affects their behavior. So for us, um, trying to find adaptable bees or bees that are specific to a particular area can be like trying to find a needle in the haystack just due to the fact that bees have been moved um, a lot throughout the US. And so I consider myself a seed saver of sorts um, in that within itself, every seed has a story formed over millennia um, and they, it has these genetic memories that it's able to pass on to the next uh, seed, right? So whether it's a plant seed or it's bees themselves, these memories that they're um, creating because, or that they're experiencing because of their environment and the passage of time um, really is imprinted in their genetic code and that, and that can be collected, it can be selected for, and it can be shared. Um, and so here's a few different um, sort of scenarios. So collecting, um, you know, things to consider are the location and the philosophy of that collection. How is one collecting these? Um, what is that process of collecting them? Um, and then selecting, are you, is one selecting for specific traits, an umbrella trait, such as longevity, which is what I like to um, focus in on. And then uh, whether or not they should and can be shared, right? So when we, you know, already in the States, we share bees across the country. Um, and that has some benefits, but it also has some detriments um, because it hasn't really allowed our bees in any one particular place to become their own uh, or to develop into their own ecotype. Um, over time and generations. So um, sharing across bioregions, should we should or should we not do that? Um, is this a cooperative sort of venture where we're sharing this in terms of a genetic pool that, that everybody can tap into or certain people in certain regions can tap into? And then how can we conserve this, whether it's through germplasm conservation um, and cryopreservation or in some other means? So environment and location has a huge um, impact on what is grown, right? Um, as we look across the US, you can see the topographical map there on the upper right. I mean, we have such diverse landscapes and the Eastern part of the US is very different than the Western part where it's very crenulated and we've got a lot of mountains. Um, we've got some deserts and we've got um, some pretty extreme and, and a lot of microclimates. Um, and all of this is really dependent on the soil type. So also being in a place where there's either a lot of soil erosion or there's flooding or what have you can really dictate what sort of habitat um, is created. And so when we look at these different sort of environmental contexts in these global soil regions, we can see that there's huge um, diversity. And then also when you look at the bouquet of the world map, which I just like picture, um, you can see that different flowers grow in different places, right? So the nutrition that's gonna be available is also gonna play a role. And then you have to ask yourself, you as a beekeeper, where are you and who are you? Who are you in the sort of grand scheme of things? And what is your philosophy and your skill level um, and your technique that you're able to, to apply with your beekeeping? So for me, just a little run through for those who aren't familiar. Um, I got started as a Peace Corps volunteer beekeeping in 1997 um, and went down the rabbit hole of queen bee breeding and haven't surfaced yet. <laughs> but I've had opportunities to work with um, Apospophora scutellata or um, aggressive Africanized bees. Um, I've also uh, been able to work um, as a technician, volunteer technician for USAID Farm to Farmer and work with beekeepers in a few different countries. Jamaica is one of them, um, Nicaragua, Morocco. Um, and then also doing research, um, not only here in my home state with New Mexico State University, but also Washington State University um, and now with the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, and through my own small farm, um, Zia Queen Bees, which is located at about 8,000 foot elevation in the Southern Rocky Mountains. So um, this is a map just showing kind of a little spreadsheet, so it's a spread map, I guess, of some of my experiences, and there's a lot more places I would love to go to and learn more about bees um, and, uh, and about beekeeping um, innovations and traditions and cultures and beekeepers are such such innovative and adaptive uh, professionals. So I find that extremely interesting. Um, but in each of these places, you know, bees are quite distinct, the way they behave, the way the seasons, 
seasons un unfold and um, how folks strategize their management in order to maximize production, but also keep their bees alive and healthy um, is pretty unique to each place, but are there, there are some universal parallels in that we all want happy and healthy bees. So in my own breeding operation, um, this epigenetic evolution is what really fascinates me, especially in the Southern Rockies, because within a 20 minute drive, you can drop several thousand feet in elevation and be in a totally different climate and go from desert to tundra um, regularly, multiple times a day, and just turning a corner or going up a hill. Um, and I found that my bees, one, I needed adaptable bees that can handle various conditions, but also um, how, they, how they survived and how they, whether they thrived or whether they struggled. I became really fascinated with. So I consider myself um, uh, breeding for longevity as a, I call it a longevity-based breeding program. Um, I used to call it survivor stock, but there's not a, a formal definition. Although if you speak to beekeepers in Europe, to them, survivor stock is minimum five years old, no treatments. And for me, you know, here in the States, we have very different conditions. So I, I consider it to be at least uh, through two winters so some of the considerations, if you want to rear queens, um, migrational, commercial, professional um, conditions or situations are going to be very different than if you're a sedentary um, hobbyist or novice backyard beekeeper. Um, you know, migrational meaning you're moving hives different places, sedentary just meaning you, you keep them in one spot. Um, the importance of finding resilient and adaptable stock can be a problem. Like I said, it's the needle in the haystack type of uh, scenario, and then um, depending on your agroecosystem or your landscapes and the nutrition that that provides. Um, you know, food is medicine, as Hippocrates says, and so if you, you know, live in an area or have your bees in an area where the, their forage might be compromised or contaminated, their nutrition is going to be affected, and um, that can lead to some other problems. So the environmental impressions, some people like to think of it as nature versus nurture. I actually like to think of it as nature nurtures and tortures. Um, and the torture is the, are these selective pressures that we do need to keep our bees um, attuned or sort of conditioned or in practice to survive something. So for instance, with varroa mites, you know, if we're trying to eradicate them, then when our bees are presented with them, they do not know how to cope. So there, there are mites, there's always gonna be some mites. And, and so having some to a certain degree will hopefully over time allow our bees to adapt, but you know, obviously too many and, and they, can't, they can't overcome them. Or, and the bigger fact that they're vectors um, of various pathogens is, is the bigger issue. And so you know, that also falls back on nutrition. You know, if they have a, a good diet, will they be able to combat these, these various um, diseases that may befall them or viruses? Um, and so it's all intertwined together and it really does requires to create an integrated system for not only pest management, but for supplements and treatments, for land stewardship, for consilience, which is one of my favorite words, which just means um, unit or unity of uh, knowledge and applied research. And I'm a big fan of biomimicry. You know, Mother Nature and Father Time have figured this out over many moons. Um, and, <laughs> you know, it behooves us to try and follow what naturally works in order to support be in pollinator health. Um, we can't necessarily create our own scenario and not be affected by those natural phenomena. So it um, makes sense for us to, to mimic as best as possible, um, which leads us to queen rearing. So how does one you know, rear queens? How, how does it happen in nature? Um, and I'll get to that in the next slide, but for me, queen rearing really follows um, six distinct steps, but they all revolve around three pretty poignant um, concepts. One is quality genetics, conscientious propagation, and mindful management. So you've got your breeders, you've got your cell builders or your starters, um, you know, or if you're doing walkaway splits, that's your, that's your basically your cell nursery, right? Then you've got grafting, if you're actually doing grafting, or if you're not grafting, you, you put select um, brood in there that you want the bees to rear queens off of. You've got the mating nukes or the receptacle hives where these cocoons are going to go. And then how you handle those cocoons, the cell care um, is very important. Um, and then when you're harvesting and you're, whether you're banking them or shipping them or installing them. And so all those steps 
really uh, play a role and any single one of those can, can have a misstep and can affect the overall quality. So reproductive behavior um, in terms of the biomimicry, uh, the connection to that is, you know, we've got three different scenarios, either emergency, supersedure, or swarming. And so one of the best ways that bees um, have themselves decided to rear queens is through swarming. Is that conditions are ideal. Um, for emergency and supersedure, they're, they're both under a lot of duress. And so there's a lot of stress at that point, um, which can be transferred into any new queens that may come out of that. But swarming is when it's ideal. And so if we wanted to follow on biomimicry, um, setting up our nursery cell builder, or um, even encouraging bees to pull cells when conditions are ideal and really stuffing that, that split or that queenless um, portion can really uh, mimic that. So uh, for longevity, this is in terms of my breeding program, um, it's an umbrella trait. And so longevity obviously is in the name long, it means over a length of time. So I like to select breeders um, that make it through minimum two winters because then I'm able to really see one, how their behavior um, is adapting to different locations, whether I have them in the valley or up on the mountain or um, out in California or in New Mexico, um, whether they remain gentle, um, honey production, can they feed themselves? Can they make extra? Are they pest and disease resistant? Can they overwinter well? Um, do they last? Are they hygienic? Um, and so all of those play a role. So I like to, to look at longevity. And so when I'm doing selection, I mean, this is uh, actually more um, about all of the different parts in terms of not only selecting, but once you've selected, which I select for longevity, then I have to look at, you know, how am I going to now transfer, help these genes or these seeds now get to the next generation to then be shared. Um, and so for those who aren't familiar, on the left is a little diagram of the process of grafting. So transferring um, the right size larva from the first instar larval stage um, when they're very small, floating on royal jelly, putting them in special cups, which go into the nursery cell builder. They get pulled out into, they're fed lots of royal jelly and then pulled out into cocoons. Those cocoons are handled carefully and then placed um, strategically in the middle of a uh, queenless brood nest. And then several weeks later, we can go back and um, check on them and make sure that they've made it and that there's eggs, larva, and capped brood to confirm their um, fecundity, and then um, we can harvest them and either uh, use them for splits or um, for requeening or for uh, offering to beekeepers. So kind of a, a little sort of overview rundown, I guess, a review. You've got your stock selection and establishment. You've got your environment and location, and you've got um, record keeping, cell propagation, Nutrition, keeping that in mind, whether you're going to graft or do walkway splits, um, the mating nuclei, your harvesting, incubating, handling, or shipping, and the fact that it takes a community, right? Because queens do fly to mate. And so if you're doing open mating, you have to keep in mind um, what is the area drone pool or congregation areas and what sort of genetics are in those. For those who are interested in a more um, in depth review of the process of grafting, Here's a YouTube video you can check out. Um, and it starts at nine minutes and 38 seconds. It's about a half hour video and I break it down um, into each step, at least for me as to how, <laughs> how I graft. Um, a few resources, um, you can download a free field guide um, that I put together a number of years ago. I, mean, I am in the process of updating it. And um, I'm also with several uh, queen producers in the Western region, organizing a virtual queen wearing um, webinar that will be April 3rd, 2021. So you can um, email me, I'll have my email at the end and I will share that information. Um, we're gonna start doing signups here soon for that. Um, there's also Be Sex Essentials, um, Dr. Larry Connor's series of books, um, Roger Morris, and then what I call the Blue Bible, the Queen Ring and Bee Breeding by um, Laidlaw and Page is, is a good one. So real quick, as I start to run out of time, um, the uh, Research that I've been doing for my thesis, um, calling it Weathering Heights and its evaluation of honeybee subspecies mating behavior, utilizing RFID, which are those little radio tags um, that you see on the backs of those queens there.
Um, so little herstory, and I already went over this at the beginning, but talking about the different subspecies and how they were brought over. And then also we remember the um, research papers I mentioned, looking at that there's specific um, ecotypes, um, the genetic origin and their interaction with their environmental effects uh, will play a role in their survival, okay? And these individual ecotypes exhibit specific behavior. So, you know, bringing that state side again, like what is, how does that work for us when we truck these bees all over and we have these bees without borders and, um, you know, mass transit for pollination events. And we also have increasing challenges, whether it's due to fluctuating weather, wildfires, drought, um, you know, late, late snows and frosts and all these things that are also affecting the plants and what nutrition may be available for bees. And then you've got all these, you know, vectored viruses from varroa mites. So there's a lot of whammies against bees, but one method towards sustainability is to try and meet the need um, for resilient honeybee stock mites. And so I, I like to encourage folks that, you know, really pay attention if it's kind of like, if you knew then what you know now, um, <laughs> you know, where would you be with your beekeeping and, and who are you as the beekeeper, right? What can you offer your bees in terms of stewardship? Um, so this early season demand really does put a crunch on the industry. Um, rearing queens, mating them out, keeping um, track of them and then being able to share them. Um, and in order for us to really track them and better understand them, you know, we know that they mate, we know that they mate up in the air, that they mate with drones, that they travel. But do we really know if it's all the same for all these, all these different kinds of bees? So here's a little quote from Carl von Frisch, but he was um, the one to really sort of portray to the world the, the waggle dance and um, observation of bees as to where and what they do um, in regards to their foraging behavior. And so, um, you know, now flashing forward, we've now got all these technological advances where we can really look at um, some of this nuanced behavior with non-invasive tools. So this is just a little couple papers here talking about um, the use of RFID for looking at um, bees, bee behavior. And um, the one on the right is observation of mating behavior of honeybees using RFID. Um, and that's looking specifically at carniolan bees. And so um, kind of branching off of this, I wanted to look at um, several different kinds and see if there were um, parallels or differences between the two. So for my research, I was looking at if there were any observable differences in virgin queen and drone mating flight periods, um, and if there's any significant interactions between the genotype, kind of the bee, right, and the environment, um, and then how that would portray in the behavior of these different subspecies. So the projected outcomes, um, I'm hoping that this information will assist in strategic planning for queen production and also promote a rearing protocol to support mating success, enhance quality and minimize colony losses. So if we, if we can better learn if certain strains mate earlier or later than others, then as producers, we can look to follow that natural calendar and really promote um, successful mating and, and endurance. So um, I'd like to thank Dr. Brandon Hawkins for initiating this project with the Bolan College of Engineering and Architecture um, senior design students. Um, and so with um, a team of engineers, there was a computer engineer, software engineer, a mechanical engineer, and electrical engineer who worked together to um, build these units for me. And that's a little tube with an antenna receiver on it. Um, first year, we uh, had to use electric power. So they're all in there on the power strip. And we just use these little Ziploc containers to keep water out. Um, because they're electric, I had to plug them in outside the building and the power went out four times. So I have no usable data for that first year, but um, I was able to establish 10 mating nuclei, um, tried to make them all the same so that they wouldn't have any solar gain. And you know, by chance, one being warmer than the other, maybe the queen would fly earlier because she's warmer. So I painted them all white, but just put different designs on the landing board so that um, there wouldn't be drift. There was a little bit of drift, but not too bad. And I reared five different rounds that um, first season, Lagustica, which is Italian, Caucasian, um, Russian crosses, and our WSU um, program bees, which have been selected for Pacific Northwest conditions. Um, I prepared all these mating nukes, and I, since they had to be plugged in, I had to put them by the building. 
So there was a lot of actual solar gain from the asphalt, but I put them up on pallets so that they wouldn't be uh, too close to the ground. And there was a weather station next door, so I've been able to look at um, what the weather patterns were during their flight times to see if there's any um, interesting scenarios or um, might be able to elucidate what it is that they uh, may be affecting their mating times or, or their flying times. Um, so yeah, we had tested this initial prototype and had a lot of issues um, due to the summer heat. Um, we had some of our uh, batteries also failed and the power went out, as I mentioned. So data was collected, but often incomplete. And this sort of experience gave me a huge, um, uh, sort of broadened my respect for research and researchers with all the details and um, setbacks and challenges that they face um, trying to better understand and to share quality information with us. Um, and so we made some uh, final um, changes and we were able to upgrade some parts. Um, my team, the engineering team, they actually won a, an award from the university for their um, design project. And yeah, then I was able to um, do it again, except this time I really reduced um, the amount. I just looked at Lagustica and Caucasica, um, tried to keep it a little bit uh, less complicated in case I had more issues. So with a grant from California State Beekeepers Association, I was able to um, make the 2.0 version, which were all solar powered. And we um, used 20 nukes instead. And so of course now I had to really sort of uh, modify the lids to have more designs. So everything was double lidded. Um, and then the top lid had a little bit different design as did the landing board, but the sides of the boxes were all painted white. We also were able to upgrade and get a snazzy new little container. Um, we have um, a little battery pack bank. So the solar um, power would charge the batteries, which would um, turn on the timer and record the information. And then um, once the timer closed, if it was still sunny, then the solar power would um, bank, bank a charge in the batteries for it to boot on the next day at the right time. Um, so I could take the laptop out there and um, basically remove an SD card and um, place it into the computer to download the information and then put the SD card back. Um, I moved them out to Smoot Hill after some difficulty, which I'll talk about here briefly. Um, preparing the tags was also um, time consuming. They usually did that the day before um, Queens, queen virgins would be emerging and then I'd wait an extra day before I would actually tag them so that their exoskeleton was, had hardened a little bit. Um, there I am in the office with a frame of virgin queens that are caged and some attendants on them, um, pulling them out to, to tag them. Um, and yeah, you can see quite how tiny it is. Some of them fell. I did learn that if I had red under stickers that um, those queens tended not to come back. And I think maybe it's because birds. But um, yeah, the first site I used was at an orchard where the cherries were ready and there was a lot of starling predation, or I believe there was starling predation. I actually put a, a cage there um, because I had one out of 20 queens return the first round. <laughs> and then Dr. Shepard encouraged me to try it again. And I did, and I had um, seven out of 20 return, but that still is not enough to really, you know, get enough data. So I, I convinced them to let me move them out to Smoot Hill, which is where um, they do the isolated breeding for their breeding program. So this is Smoot Hill, which is a nature preserve. I put them all up on boxes because the grass can grow there and I didn't want that to impede the entrance or for any other, um, you know, ants or anything like that to be able to get up there quite easily. So we're, um, Panels are on top. And yeah, um, I did get a little bit of predation though from a praying mantises. So <laughs> this is a video that another grad student took for me. Um, I had to run down to, to New Mexico during the summer and I had him just check on my units to make sure that they were powering off and on. And, and he took this video, his name is Safet Sansar um, from Turkey. And he also did RFID research on um, bees uh, on foraging bees and their return times from contaminated nectar, uh, if it had nectar that had been infused with pesticides or sugar syrup, I guess I should say. Um, at any rate, so I plan to do some um, R Studio uh, programming to figure out the statistics. 
and um, the time and date stamps. So as the queen or drone passes through the, the tube, the antenna is beaming a signal and it, and it bounces back off of that chip. And then it actually records onto the SD card the date and time um, because we have a GPS that's also in sync with satellite in order to get um, the uh, UTC or the, or the time timestamp. Um, the results, I'm hoping that they can provide a fundamental improvement on our understanding of honeybee mating behavior and will also be relevant to the profitability of producers and beekeepers. So um, yeah, I took a year to uh, do some research abroad and very sadly the pandemic um, cut that research short, but I had wanted to repeat this, um, these field experiments in Spain, which is a really interesting country. It's um, you know, near where honeybees originated from, but it's also a bridge between Western Europe and Africa. And so they have Apis mellifera iberiensis is their um, local ecotype bee. And I really um, wanted to, to see how, how local bees uh, perform in their own home regions. Um, and so I uh, was able to do my project with a group called COAG, which is Coordinated Organization of Farmers and Ranchers. Um, and I predominantly was in Andalusia in the southern part of Spain and got to meet some of these beekeepers beforehand in Montreal at Apamondia and then um, while I was in country. So I really wanna say thank you to um, WSU um, Bee Lab team, um, engineers, um, grad students, um, diagnosticians, um, and of course my advisor, Dr. Stephen Shepard. So ending thoughts, um, seeds, you know, as a seed saver, as a bee seed saver, um, you know, it's, we're looking for those strains that can endure the seasonal transitions and conserve them and share them. Um, and if you'd like to read more about my research that I did with my Fulbright and National Geographic um, in Spain, you can check out a few of these um, Arches story maps. I'm still putting more up. I'm also putting together a, a short podcast series with some interviews with the Spanish beekeepers and researchers that I got to visit with. And thank you very much. So yeah, feel free to email me. It may take me a uh, a week or so to respond sometimes, but I do try to respond to every email. And yeah, we'll be doing a, a collaborative uh, Western Region virtual queen rearing workshop on April 3rd, 2021. All right, thank you. Fascinating, Melanie, as usual. Um, we got a note that someone is up at 3 a.m. listening to you, so um, from Whoa. all around the world. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll start with a real tough one from California, Karen Veteros. Melanie, Assuming constant weather conditions and time of year, does the rate of mating success of virgin queens decrease with increased age of the virgin as of her first mating flight? In other words, is the mating success of a virgin queen who goes on mating flights within one week or of emergence greater than the mating success of a virgin who goes on her mating flights within two or three weeks after emergence? You know, that's a really good question. Um, there definitely is a certain time frame in which they, they go, you know. Um, and I know Dr. Connor had done some research looking at um, releasing virgin queens at different, at different um, ages to see when they would still go to mate. And I think he had one that was 28 days old and she still went out and mated and performed well for the rest of the season. Um, so, I mean, they're, I'm not sure. You know, I think a lot of it, really relates to, to Julia's talk too, which is it really depends on the drones. And so a lot of times the early season queens, if we, you know, you may see drones, but maybe they're not sexually mature yet. And so people get really excited, you know, they go, okay, I want to, I, I need to start making splits or the bees even want to get, um, get going. But if the drones are not sexually mature, then you're not going to have very well mated queens. And so in that respect, you know, um, that might play a role into it too. But I, I think it, I think, you know, I feel like that's that's definitely a loaded question because I think it depends on location and and circumstance, right? So if if, if you have a queen that you know somehow didn't get out or it was super bad weather for a while, I mean that might really impact it. But in my experience, they usually go and especially from the research scene, they all tend to go mate within the first seven days. 
Okay, great. I, I do know with the II program, there was always a problem getting, you know, the semen from drones. And if you if they're too young, you just don't get the semen. So, right. Uh, Melanie, um, what subspecies of bee do you feel are best for New Mexico with the Africanized uh, influence there? That's a good question. I mean, we have elevation working to our advantage so far. Um, so where I'm at in, you know, I'm at about between 7,000 and 8,000 foot elevation and we don't have a presence of them there. I keep my fingers crossed because it's just gonna take one beekeeper to bring in bees from an Africanized zone or even from downstate. And that could really sort of quash 20 years of breeding program that, that I've been um, focusing on. So if you're, in the, if you're in the Southern counties, I mean, it's, it's warmer weather there. There's still a winter, but it's less severe. And I kind of find, at least within my own selection program, I like mixed stocks. I like um, diverse genetics within a single hive family. So I really, um, and my stock changes year by year because I'm, in, I'm inducting new breeders and sort of retiring um, other ones. And so I kind of feel that it, it, there's not one super bee, right? But especially for my neck of the woods or for New Mexico in general, where we have you know, everything from desert to tundra, it's really going to depend a little bit more about where exactly and what elevation you're at. So my hives that are up in the mountains, I really like Caucasian bees. It's super cold weather um, in the winter, but we do get good solar gain. And if you're in the lower elevation, you could probably um, get away with a more, you know, strictly Italian sort of Mediterranean bee. That, that kind of question kind of segs into one from Megan, a great one. As a migratory beekeeper, I noticed the bees adapting to different regions' climates slash climates relatively quickly after the bees are moved. How do you think this differs from locally adapted in paren stock versus bees adapted, adapting to the environment they are in at any given time? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Megan. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting because I, I totally agree with her. I think, you know, well, let's look at it this way. On the one hand, we're talking about honeybees, which are generalist pollinators, right? And so they are very um, open to adapting. And that's why they've been able to spread across, you know, vast terrains in different um, climates and topographies, you know, especially looking at the ones that are in the Middle East and then in Eastern Europe. I mean, the bees are adaptable, honeybees are adaptable. And so the bees we have here in the States, that's why they were also able to bring bees in. And as they move westward, these bees also adapted. Um, and so I kind of feel that, yeah, bees are quick to adapt, but I think in terms of, you know, locally adapted stock is really looking at it as more of how how are they able to endure in a particular region over time, right? So on the one hand, like I've had bees from, that I got out of uh, Georgia one time, they were beautiful Italians, um, they're Purvis queens, and I thought they were wonderful. However, they couldn't handle, they were still brooding up in January and they, they didn't make it through winter. And so I don't take that as a fault of the breeder or um, the way they were bred. I think they were just not used to my climate, you know, so that that's just, you know, obviously an observation, but that was one that really stuck in my mind because they were beautiful bees, but yeah, they just, they, they kept brooding up and they didn't shut down. And then that was that, you know? Um, and so I, it depends. It also, I think, depends on the stock that you start with or where you got it from. But with the migratory beekeepers and the queen producers even who are, um, have their bees in different places, like their bees are pretty adaptable because they've, they've already been sort of testing them in different spots. And that's one of the reasons why I like to even go out there too and gather genetics is to, is to broaden that sort of genetic toolkit and that, that story, that seed story within my bees so that they, in my mind, and hope is that they're more adaptable to different places. Yeah, and, and, and still on that locally adapted bees, uh, uh, Don Bennett had asked, when a term in quotes, local adapted bees is used to describe EHBs, European honeybees in America, what does that mean? I assume Europeans laugh at us about the issue. <laughs> right, yeah, what does it mean? Um, I, it, you know, the States is its own sort of uh, anomaly, right? Because when you look at all these other countries where they have their bees and, you know, they're, 
yes, some of them are migratory, but not to the extent that we have here in the States. I mean, for them, their migrations may be just between the lowlands and highlands within their own little region. And for us, it's transcontinental, you know, it's all the way across, you know, um, the country. And um, so I think you're right, you know, it's like, what, <laughs> what does locally adapted really, really mean? And I think it, um, you know, I can only speak for myself, every producer is going to have sort of their own version of it. But I think it's those that are, that are tested there, meaning allowed to perform in a given area and then monitored over time and they consistently do well. And then they become what we consider adapted to that spot. And so I just heard talk by Dr. Seeley this past weekend where he was, somebody had asked him too, like how long does it take for bees to adapt? Um, and there's no real, you know, firm answer on that because on the one hand, like Megan said, you know, they adapt pretty quickly. They, when I take bees out to California within hours of setting them down, they've already found pollen and they're bringing it in you know, so they, they can adapt, <laughs> but it's how, how well do they endure over time? And I think that that, um, especially with shifting climate or other environmental stresses, you know, that's going to be very particular by place. Yeah. I think, you know, like terms we use like defensive acronized bees or sustainability, that's, it's almost as many definitions as there are people using the terms. Um, exactly. Exactly. Um, someone had asked you to use the term Kona Queens and Robert Nelson answered that that is a brand name. So that's one of the questions that's in there. Um, from Emily Hunter, what traits do you monitor and how do you track each hive uh, for your breeding program? Good question. So we put colored plaques on every hive and the color depends on the um, international color code for the year. Um, and so when I, when I install a new queen, one that I've reared, or even one that I've, you know, swapped or gotten or bought from somebody else that I want to uh, monitor and, and consider integrating in, they'll get a plaque on the outside. Um, if it's my own hives, then we know, you know, which daughter, or we know that she's a daughter from whichever breeder. Um, and so we keep track of that. And so those get labeled down as well. Um, and then in terms of traits, it, it all goes, it's just every time we do a hive visit, we write on the lid. And then a lot of that gets translated onto, my farm partner still likes pen and paper. I do, I actually use my, my notes on my phone a lot where um, I'll even take pictures or I'll just at least write down my own sort of shorthand coding on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, we're, if we have to add food or if they're weak, I mean, sometimes we can tell that it's not them, it's the location, like say we have a drought, you know, then every, but nobody's making honey. Well, then we know that that may not necessarily be because they're not able to, it's just because the location isn't, doesn't have enough forage or what have you. Um, and so everything gets recorded down. And so when, I mean, over time, like if I'm selecting breeders, once they're installed, you know, they're in the system and every time we see them we we mark down what we're seeing and then after the second winter when we get to that that third spring for them um if we find some that look good you know a lot of it's kind of like by feel but if they look at them we look back at their records and then we can go oh yeah look this one stayed good and my farm partner he's panicked a couple times so i don't call myself a treatment free beekeeper um because i feel that you know if my bees are suffering, I'm going to do something, whether that's offering them um, an herbal tea or even potentially essential oils, which I've done on occasion. Um, so I don't consider, you know, and he's panicked sometimes to the extreme where he's had some hives or a yard where there was an outbreak of foul brood and he's panicked, but then those bees are, are earmarked and we never use them as breeders, but um, we'll use them as, you know, honey producers or what have you later on. So um, I think I don't know how I got on this tangent, but um, <laughs> um, I got on this tangent somehow. But I think it's, yeah, it's, you know, when we're monitoring traits, everything gets recorded down. And so that way we can look back and because we have those plaques, we can say, oh, look, this is, you know, daughter of Eve. And she, you know, we had to actually give her honey or, you know, oh, she developed chalk brood, you know. And so over time too, the bees will, they'll weed out the ones that they don't want. I mean, we go, every queen's marked. So when we go back in, if there's a queen that's not marked, then we know either they superseded or something else happened, right? Sometimes been the replaced. paint, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sometimes the paint comes off, but sometimes, yeah. you, sometimes you can see a remnant, so. Yeah. 
For those that ask questions about the resources that you listed and, uh, and your email, those again will be on the recording. So you can look those up when we get the recording. Anthony, Anthony Antonucci is up pretty late. He's back in New York, so it's getting near 11, his bedtime. So let's get to his question. Anthony asks, what would be a maximum time for banking mated queens obtained from a queen breeder? A maximum time? That's what he's asking. Be a maximum time for banking mated queens. Wow. Well, um, I've long. seen some queens banked a long time, like months and months. Um, and they still get accepted and they, and they lay. Um, I myself don't like to bank queens for very long. I mean, when I, I mean, we're small scale too. So when I have orders coming in, we, we try and have, we, we graft on a schedule. It used to be every four days. Now it's the past couple of years because I was in grad school, it was more like just once a week. Um, but then we're able to catch say on a Sunday and ship out on a Monday. So I try not to bank for very long. If I bank, um, you know, maybe at most it's a week, but I, you know, I have worked at places where they have banked them for months, you know, especially some of the, some of the warmer areas where they're able to rear Queens, like in winter, you know, they're, they're able to rear Queens and bank a bunch of them so that then when they get their spring demand, they can send out thousands, you know, all at once. Um, and it's, it's, I, I don't know, it'd be good to really sort of follow Queens like that and see, you know, if it, if it, if, affects their longevity or or how that goes on the receiving end but yeah it would be anthony then also followed up any recommendations for techniques for successfully requeening some say caging the queen is the best way so you've produced your quality queen how what would you recommend to someone using one of your queens how would they successfully requeen with it if it's for requeening or even splitting i often recommend that folks um dequeen the the half or the portion that's you know, the split that's going to receive the queen, um, or even if it's just one colony, then they dequeen de her um, at least a day, but preferably two. Um, but I mean, I've, I've heard from beekeepers that say, oh, I just removed her 20 minutes before and I put a new one in, but they always install with a cage. Um, I've installed virgins before. Virgins can kind of slip in a little bit easier. Um, so like when I'm catching from my mating nukes, it's usually day 28. Um, so they've been in there for four weeks and this is after, after emerging and mating. And so then um, I, I try and put in a ripe cell, right? So I know that the cell is gonna emerge within like a day or two. So that there's at least a brief period where that, that nuke or that split is queenless. Um, but you know, then there's some, uh, I've had cells emerge out and it's like I've had these virgins and I want to get them in and I have to catch and put them in and I learned a trick actually from one of my mentor beekeepers Gary Reskovich from Florida and Wisconsin and he would take virgin queens and plunk them in a little bit of powdered sugar and then just plop them in the hive and the bees start cleaning them and licking them and they're kind of in like Flynn and I've had 90% success doing it that way when I've had virgin queens doing it but when when putting in mated queens I like to dequeen at least um, a day or two ahead of time, and then um, install her in a cage. Usually, sometimes if uh, I'll pull out some of the candy, I use the Jay Z B Z cages, so I might I might pull out about half the candy. Um, if it's a hive or a colony that's been queenless for a while, I definitely remove about half the candy because I want them to get to her sooner. But if you know if you're dequeening and then trying to put another queen in right away, sometimes you should add candy or tape over the end, and you could still put the cage in there with the new queen in, but then wait a day or two and then go release the tape and then they can start and kind of do a slow release. You can do a push in cage too. Um, but I, I use the Jay-Z BZ, so I just, uh, it's either I tape over the ends if I feel like they need more time without a queen, but I like to actually leave them full on queenless for at least a day or two. Uh, Dewey says, I think we should let uh, Melanie off the hook pretty soon here. Maybe take one more question. Okay. <laughs> Um, Larry Connor used to drip the, dip the queens in vanilla extract, um, and then he'd use it on his, his ice cream for a snack at night, so that worked pretty well. <laughs> then finally, should hives be requeened every year? Oh, man. I think it depends on what sort of bees you have in there. Um, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of sort of complaints I hear from people is that queens aren't lasting very long um, in general, and not so much like 
my queens or any particular queens, but I, I hear a lot that, you know, queens don't seem to be lasting as long as they used to. And again, that falls back on, you know, well, were they mated with enough drone saturation or is it more that they're just running out of semen? Was there some other environmental stressor or situation that um, has uh, impacted the lifespan and the longevity or the fitness of the hive? Um, for me, because I like to watch them over time, and in this sense, I'll share you, I'll share this with you because you mentioned the Europeans um, laughing at us. You know, there's the Colos group now who's got a survivor task force, and their definition of survivor is five years. The queens have to be minimum five years old. And that's very rare to find now in the States, right? So in that sense, I mean, we, we don't even always meet that criteria, but for me, two years seems, seems possible. Um, but I have heard from people that, you know, they, they have to requeen every six months. And I think a lot of that just depends, you know? So for me, if I have a queen and she's doing good and um, I'm not gonna requeen her, the, the bees will start to, sh you know, they'll, they'll show that they wanna start superseding her if she's starting to, to slow down if another issue makes itself apparent. But there is a, there's a fine line. I mean, you wanna keep it productive and as a small operation, I can't afford to have a bunch of hives gimping along, you know, like at some point I need them to all be, you know, paying for themselves, so to speak. <laughs> they never pay me, but at least pay for themselves. <laughs> yeah. Oh, very good. You got a number of nice comments on your on your talk, and uh, I'd like to uh, second that with the others of um, the um, WAS. Great talk. Uh, many people very uh, enthusiastic about both of the uh, the discussions this evening. So, good job.